Good afternoon. Good to have everyone with us today. We are uh, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, we're actually in the middle of a series, if you've just joined us for the first time. And it's called God's Love Story. We're trying to bring the Old and New Testaments together and, and, and just show how they connect together. Um, it is, uh, you are, I am in Waxahachie, Texas. No, you are probably not. Maybe you are. Um, it is the month of October 2024 and it's starting to cool off a little bit so uh, maybe summer is starting to come to an end here in Texas but we'll see because it, it can have a way to extending uh, quite a quite a few more days yet so we'll see but I'm glad we glad you're with us today I uh, pray that when you see Jesus in the book of Isaiah uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at today that your faith is just gonna soar even though this is an Old Testament book, you're going to see just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in that book, and it's all pointing to Jesus. So get ready to have your faith uh, soar today. All right, before we get started, just want to let you know that you are on my YouTube channel. So if you want to see more videos on these subjects, uh, you can type in Saving Souls in the 21st Century, and you've got a couple of channels there. If you get the, the brown S there behind my picture, those are my older videos. If you get the one in, uh, with the picture of me standing behind a podium, those are my newer videos. Uh, you can also get on my website, savingsouls.net. Uh, it'll tell all about me, the workshops I do for evangelism, the workbooks I have, all that stuff. Uh, you, can, you can contact me there with my email and also call the Brown Street Church of Christ. So that's about me. If you get on my YouTube channel and you get back on there on any videos and you like those videos, I'm going to ask you to hit that like button. This helps these videos really get farther out to a bigger audience. And also, if you're not, uh, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I uh, ask you that you hit the subscribe button. And we're almost at a thousand people, and that's going to put us in another category and hopefully get these videos out to even more people in this world. So that's enough of the advertisement. Now let's get to the lesson. So here we are. We're connecting that old to the new and bringing the whole Bible together. That's the purpose today. And what we're going to look at are the prophecies about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was written right around 722 B.C., okay? So when we think of the book of Isaiah and we think about Jesus, a lot of us will think about Isaiah 53. Now, the whole chapter 53 is a prophecy about Jesus. I mean, it's just one after another after another. We're not going to spend a lot of time there today. We're going to hit one verse, but we're going to look at all these other verses that we don't normally think about. But I, but I do want to go to one, and that's Isaiah 53, verse 1, and this is how it starts out. It says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Okay, so here's Isaiah writing this in 722, approximately B.C., 700 years before Jesus gets here. Okay, this is what he says. So we're going to go and we're going to connect that to the book of John chapter 12. And I want you to see what John chapter 12 says. So here's Jesus in verse 37 and 38. And it says, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still wouldn't believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of who? Isaiah the prophet. Oh, them not listening to Jesus was actually fulfilling a verse out of Isaiah. And here's what it says. Lord, whom has, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And where did that come from? The book of Isaiah. So Jesus was written about in the book of Isaiah and fulfilled in the book of John. Now, that's a huge proof for people that doubt the Bible, that don't believe in the Bible. This is proving that the Bible is real and that it's true. And we need to use that with people. But before we get to the other people, which we will eventually want to get to, to we want to talk about us. Does this encourage your faith to know that this isn't some man-made book that was just written by ordinary people and 
It's just another book of all the many books in the world? Or is this book different? Is this Bible different? And yes, this proves that this Bible is way different. And those Pharisees, those Sadducees, they hated Jesus. They would not believe in him. So sad. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. And here is what it says. Now this is this is the story of uh, Isaiah here, okay? And King Uzziah has just died. He gets this vision from God of the temple and the smoke and the train of his veil filled the temple. And then he asks, who's going to go for me? Who am I going to send? And Isaiah says, I'll go. I'll go. And then he tells them, this is the message I want you to take out to the people. Verse 9 says, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. This is the English Standard Version here, okay? Make the heart of this people fat, make their uh, ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn again and be healed. Basically, what Isaiah's, what God's saying to Isaiah is when you take this message out, it's just going to shut people's ears. It's going to close their hearts. That's what the message of God is going to do because man is so stubborn, so selfish. Now, this was written in about 722 B.C., but now let's go over here to the book of John chapter 12 in about 29 AD and let's see what it says about those verses. We're going to continue where we were just reading a minute ago over in John. It says, for this reason they could not believe. They couldn't believe. For Isaiah said again in another place in Isaiah, he has blinded their eyes, has hardened their heart, so that they could not see with their ear, ears or eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. That's coming out of Isaiah chapter 6. These things Isaiah said because he saw, here it is, his glory. I'm sorry, that's right behind my picture. Because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who is the him here? Jesus. John is saying that the book of Isaiah was speaking about Jesus and his glory. And when his message goes out, people will close their ears, close their eyes, hearts will be hardened, and they will miss Jesus. And it was all predicted back in the book of Isaiah. Now let me just make a point here, okay? Our premillennialist friends, okay, the ones that teach that Jesus is going to come back to this earth and reign for a thousand years and there's going to be peace on earth. Now that's taught in many, 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 many denominations in our world today. And they say that when Jesus came, the, the, the theology that they have is when he came to this earth, it was a shock to him that the Jews rejected him, okay? He was coming to set up his kingdom. That was going to be plan A. But instead, he was shocked that his people rejected him. So he went to plan B instead and set up the church. Then, once the Jews accept Jesus, then he's going to come back, reign on this earth for a thousand years. Now, that is a theory, but that theory has to be incorrect. And here's why. Because these verses say what? Jesus was not shocked that his people rejected him. This was written in the Old Testament 700 years before we got here. And what is Jesus called, by the way, in the book of John? The Word. Whose words are these that came out of the Old Testament in Isaiah? Jesus' words. And whose words are these in the New Testament? Jesus' words. They're all Jesus' words. 
Does Jesus know his word? Absolutely he does. There was no shock. There was no plan B. God's kingdom is here now. And that's another study that you could go to on my YouTube channel and see that there is not going to be any thousand year reign on this earth and everything's going to be wonderful and Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. That is a man-made theory that's been picked out and picked out. You pick this verse and you pick this verse. You take this one out of context and that one out of context. You bring them together and it's just a false theology. And these verses right here, they prove that. I hope you can see that. And again, if you want to study that even more, get on my YouTube channel in the Book of Romans and look for these studies on this subject. Okay, back to Isaiah. <laughs> people hated Jesus. His own people, the Jews, religious people, high priests, Pharisees, teachers of the law, they missed Jesus. And we're going to see in a minute why. <laughs> Isaiah 7, 14. Now, this is another prophecy about Jesus. This is a very popular one. It says in Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay? The virgin. Going to have a child, going to bear a son, and his name's going to be Emmanuel. Okay? So here's this prophecy. Written in 722 BC. And then we come to Matthew chapter 1. And watch what happens. In verse 22 it says, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through who? The prophet. Saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. God with us. So here in the book of Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus is born, it is prophesied that there's going to be somebody that's going to come and be with us. A son, born of a virgin, and he's going to come to this earth. But guess who he is? God with us. God with us. Who is Jesus? He is God. And it was prophesied 700 years before he came here. Now, here's what's amazing to me. That God would come and be among us. That would be like us. Doesn't that amaze you? I think about this when we take communion. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about us gaining confidence in Jesus. Uh, he was tested in every way that we are, and yet was without sin. We can gain confidence in him. I need confidence in this world. I have a struggle with sin. Temptation and the Satan and all that Satan throws at me day after day after day. Where do I get my confidence from? Jesus. Why? Because he came down and became one of us. He stood right where we stand. God is not some far off God that he doesn't know what we go through. He's like, no, I've been there. Jesus got sick. He dealt with people. He dealt with people who hated him. He dealt with temptation. Every temptation that we have, he's dealt with. And yet through all that, he said no to sin. That's pretty impressive. That means that I can say no to sin. I can actually say no to it. A lot of times I don't, but I can. Who do I need to look to? Jesus. Because who is he? He's God. And why? Because he came down and became one of us. That's amazing to me. Amazing to me. That's where your confidence should come from. That's the confidence that we can have by looking to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming down to this earth and being one of us. And knowing how it is to live here. And here he comes. Born of a virgin. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 and 2. But there will be no more, no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt 
the land of Zubalim, and the land of Naphtali. But in his, in his latter times, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now let's put this book in perspective here. If you know your timeline, 722 BC, the Assyrians are coming down and they are fighting and destroying the land of Israel. At this point, they have taken away the northern tribe, okay? So that was 10 tribes to the north. They have taken away, taken them away into slavery. In this last lesson that we've seen about King Hezekiah, which was our last lesson, if you want to go back and look at that, you're going to see that God orchestrated all that. The northern tribe got away from God. He sent prophet after prophet, and they wouldn't listen. And he said, look, if you don't turn back to me, I'm going to haul you away with hooks in your nose. That's the book of Amos. And so he took away Zebulun, and he took away Naphtali. He did that. That was judgment on them. But then it says in the latter times he has made glorious the way of the sea. Something glorious? Something glorious in latter times? Well, let's see what that gloriousness is in latter times. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dealt, dwelt in the land of the deep darkness on them has light shown. There is a light coming. Yes, judgment. Yes, it looks bad. Yes, it was bad on Zubalim. Yes, it was bad on Naphtali. But there's a light coming. wonder who that light was pointing to. Well, let's see. So here we are in 722 BC in Isaiah 9. And I want us to go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, this is John the Baptist, okay? All right. He withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of where? Zebulun and Naphtali. Those are tribes to the north. It's up by the Sea of Galilee. Yes. So that what was spoken by the prophet who? Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And who was that light pointing to? From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. No, it's not coming when Jesus comes down here and reigns for a thousand years, sometime in our future, supposedly by what certain people teach. No, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here, Jesus says. Those verses were pointing to Jesus. Jesus is that light. He can give those nations hope in the middle of despair. And that's what Jesus does to our entire, entire world. Unfortunately, most people have missed him. I pray that you don't. So Jesus is that light. All predicted in the book of Isaiah. Now let's go to chapter 28, verse 16. So this is what, what, what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. Okay? A rock, a cornerstone, a foundation, a tested stone, okay? Who trusts will never be dismayed. The one. Verse 16 says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be dis dis disturbed. What I read the first time was an NIV, okay? But in this one, it says a costly cornerstone, okay? 
cornerstone. But this one is a costly one. Costly. Who is this pointing to? Who is this costly stone? Well, here in Isaiah, it was pointing to Matthew 21. Now let's go to Matthew 21 and see what it says here. Now this is back to the NIV. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? He's trying to get them to go back, okay? Trying to prove who he was to these people. Have you ever never read back here? The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, I want to say something right here. The NIV is the only one that uses the word capstone. Everybody else uses the word cap or a cornerstone. Okay, now there is a difference in these stones. These are something that people would be familiar with back during these times of how they built things. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But look at verse 30, 43 and 44. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Okay, the Gentiles. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Okay, falls on it. Now a cornerstone would be down below and you could fall on that stone or trip over that stone. That's down below, a cornerstone. But to whom it falls will be crushed. Now, wait a minute. How can a stone be on the ground at the same time that it's up in the air? And how can it fall on you and you trip over it at the same time? Okay, well, apparently the writer here is bringing both concepts in. And so the NIV has brought in the word capstone because capstone is actually up top and it can fall on you. So they're going with the second part, but the other translations are going with the first part, cornerstone. Let me, let me show you what I mean here. Okay. So see where the capstone is? It's up on the top. The cornerstone is down below. All right. And then there was also a keystone, right? So you trip over one and you have the other one fall on you. Now, both of these stones are pointing to Jesus, okay? Now look at the New American Standard updated version. Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, okay? They're using cornerstone where the NIV used capstone. The word chief should be there, or head, the head cornerstone. It's the most important of all cornerstones and that's pointing to who jesus this came about from the lord and it is marvelous in our eyes quoting from isaiah therefore i say to you the kingdom of god will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and to whomever it falls it will scatter him like dust the point is this don't trip over don't let this stone fall on don't miss this stone jesus because if you miss him you'll miss it all he is the most important stone in the structure he is what keeps the structure together and all three of these stones are vital in keeping a structure together in the way they built things back then we want to make sure we don't miss Jesus. And that was talked about in Isaiah and fulfilled by Jesus in Matthew 21. Isn't that amazing? And it's just one verse after another verse, after another verse, after another verse pointing to Jesus. I hope this is strengthening your faith. Now Isaiah 29 verse 18. On that day, the deaf will hear words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. The afflicted also will increase in their gladness in the Lord, and the needy of mankind will rejoice in the one of Israel. Okay? So, the Holy One of Israel. There we go. That's right behind my picture. So we're talking about the deaf, the blind, the afflicted, and the needy. They're going to rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. This is written in Isaiah 29. 
So here we are in Isaiah 29, and I want us to look over here at Matthew chapter 11. In verse 2 it says, When John heard in prison that what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples and asked him, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect somebody else? So here's John the Baptist. Baptist, he's in prison, right? He sent his disciples, go ask Jesus, are, are you it? Or is this somebody else, right? And that shows the humanness of John the Baptist. It's like he got it before, but now he's got some questions. So this is what Jesus says back to him. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. Well, what have you been hearing? What have you been seeing? The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is a man who does not fall away on account of me. I think that was pointing back to Isaiah? I think it was. Because the blind are going to see. And they're going to see by who? Jesus, the Holy One of Israel. And he is the Holy One. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 30. Let's see. No, we're going to go back in the 20s. Let's go back to 27 or 8. Look at those verses, and you'll see that Jesus is also called the Holy One. Now let's go to Isaiah 42, verse 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. And he will bring forth justice in the Gentiles, to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor will, ra will, nor will he raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets, a, bu a bruised reed. He will not break a smoking flax, he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastland shall wait for his laws. Okay, Isaiah 42. Now let's go to Matthew 12. But when Jesus knew this, he withdrew from there and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Huh, Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. And he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Wow. <laughs> Jesus says, that was me. And that was fulfilled by Isaiah 700 years before I got here. See, Jesus didn't have to walk around and tell people who he was. All he had to do was say, did you see who Isaiah said I was? Did you see who Zechariah said I was? Did you see who Daniel said I was? Did you see who Moses said I was? They were all talking about me before I ever got here. And he just reminds them of this over and over and over again. Amazing. Amazing. Now Isaiah 50 verse 6. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard, I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Now we're going to go over here to Matthew 26, verse 66. What is your judgment? They answered. He deserves death. This is Jesus on the cross. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? So before Jesus went to the cross, on his way there, he was being tried. And this is what they did to him. Does that sound like Isaiah? Sure, sure does. Who was that pointing to? Jesus. And that's what they did, didn't they? They struck him. 
They beat him. They hit him. That's what they did. That was pointing to Jesus. And now Isaiah 61. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. There's Isaiah 61. Where was that pointing to? It's actually pointing to Luke chapter 4. Now look at Luke chapter 4. Here's Jesus and he comes into town. He's coming back to Nazareth. This is where he grew up at. He spent most of his life there, right? He didn't start his ministry until 30 years old. He comes back and preaches to these people. Now, watch what it says. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. So he specifically goes to this spot. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus reads these. He's reading these words. Okay, and they're all listening to this. Okay. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all were uh, were in the synagogue were fixed on him. They're all looking at him. Like you read that, and then you sit down. And he said. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today it's fulfilled in your hearing. What was Jesus saying? I'm the fulfillment of that. That was me that Isaiah was talking about. Now this amazed those people. They're like, wait a minute. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this who just grew up right here in our town? Right? We know him. And all of a sudden, you're telling us that that was you? Do you know what they did with Jesus? They took him out to the cliff in Nazareth there and was going to throw him off. And Jesus just walks through the crowd. They couldn't handle it. It's like, there's no way. This can't be you. We know you. But it was. It was pointing to Jesus. It was pointing to Jesus. We got one more. If you continue and go through Isaiah 60 and you read 1 through 12, or you can go back and read all that. We're not going to read it all today. Notice what it says in verse 10 and following. Foreigners will rebuild your walls and their kings will serve you. Though in anger I struck you, in favor I will show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut day or night so that men may bring you the wealth of the nations. Their kings led in triumphal procession for the nation or kingdom that will not serve you. It will be utterly ruined. Yeah, sure will. Okay, now this is hope. God here in the book of Isaiah here in these last chapters is giving Israel hope. The tribe of Judah hope. Now they can relate to that, a city, gates, being open, being closed, nations, bringing their splendor into you. Where is this fulfilled at? I want you to look at Revelation 21. In verse 22 it says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. 
the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Now, there's two ways of looking at this chapter. Is this chapter talking about heaven? Or is this chapter talking about the church? And I think both can apply. But I really think it really applies to God's people. The church. And that's what the church is called here in the book of Revelation. A city. Okay? And so here's this picture of a city. But notice... The nations will walk by its light. The kings will bring their splendor into it. And on no day will its gates ever be shut. That comes from the book of Isaiah. So again, all of this hope, all pointing to Jesus, because Jesus ultimately, if Jesus doesn't come and die and buried and raised, we can never have any of these blessings. We can never be this city, the city that we are today, God's city, a light to this world. It's not us. It's just his light shining through us. I hope this has helped you. I hope this has blessed you. We have just looked at, at a few. We didn't even go through Isaiah 50, 53, where there's just prophecy after prophecy. But there's just so many here in the book of Isaiah. So conclusion. Wow. That's really all you can say. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? all these prophecies about Jesus and their fulfillment in the New Testament, written 700 years before he got here. That is a massive proof. And again, it just points, paint, it paints a picture of who Jesus is, what he came to do, what he came to accomplish, and what he can give you and I today. Don't miss Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. He's, he's all that we have. He's where all of our hope is at. And I pray that you are in him and that you are a part of him and you're a part of his kingdom that you can be a part of today and that your sins are washed away through baptism and you enter in to that body of Christ and just walk faithfully the rest of your life. And if there's any way that I can help to guide you to Jesus, you just give me a holler and I would love to do that. God bless you and we will see you next time.